Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, how jihad insurgents govern. My name is uh, Morten Bøås. I'm a research professor at uh, NUPI, and I'm uh, very pleased to uh, be moderating this uh, seminar on behalf of the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime, a consortium um, headed by the by CIREX and uh, NUPI. Today, we will uh, get a presentation from Natasha Rupsinge. Natasha is a PhD candidate, uh, is a PhD fellow at NUPI and a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford, uh, Nuffield College. Her PhD project is part of a NUPI-led uh, project called Drago Sahel that has been funded by the Norwegian Research Council. And Drago Sahel aims to understand how they had this govern as well as why jihadist, gover jihadist governance differs between and within sub-factions in the same group. Natasha's uh, PhD project examined why jihadist insurgents mobilize more successfully in some areas but not others, focusing on central uh, Mali, Burkina Faso and, uh, and Niger. And this working paper aims to synthesize existing academic knowledge about the Hadi governance in the Sahel. So uh, without much further ado, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Natasha that is going to speak for about 20-25 uh, minutes. <coughs> Thereafter, we will open uh, this uh, seminar for um, um, uh, questions, and <coughs> questions and comments from the audience. Uh, please use the um, um, the Q&A uh, chat function uh, for, for this, and um, the seminar is going to last for about, uh, for exactly one hour and 15 minutes, so we will close this at 10.15 uh, as uh, advertised. I very much look forward to this. Um, I, I have worked uh, myself with Natasha and uh, followed her uh, career and um, I'm certain that uh, uh, this will be of much interest, not only to myself, but also to all of you in the attendance. So without further ado, uh, Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Morten. I'm just going to, uh, can you confirm that you can see the slides? Uh, so I just want to thank really the, the Consortium for Research on Terrorism. Um, thank you to Morten for chairing uh, and Gabriella for organizing as well as the NUPI team. Um, uh, for all the support in organizing this event. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, about basically a, a working paper um, that myself and two colleagues from Oxford, uh, Mikhail Hibar Nagizadeh and, and Corentin Cohen have been uh, working on. And um, really the purpose of this paper um, was to systematically review uh, the literature on jihadist uh, governance in the Sahel to kind of um, uh, to, to be used as kind of a launch pad for future research on this topic. Um, and as Morten mentioned, uh, this uh, paper is part of a GGOV Sahel, um, which is uh, a, a research project led by NUPI and where we focus on um, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger and uh, Nigeria. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of what I'm going to cover uh, in the presentation. So I'm going to just briefly go over uh, the state of the literature, uh, some of the motivations and the puzzles which are driving this research. Um, then I'm going to have a look at um, what we broadly know about how jihadist insurgents govern. Um, so I'm going to kind of go over some of the broad patterns um, and then I'm going to go more in depth into uh, two case studies of jihadist governance in northern Mali as well as central Mali. Then I'm going to have a look at sort of the broad lines about what we know about how they govern differently. Um, and then I'm going to end with some with some concluding thoughts. Okay, so when we think about jihadist insurgents, um, the main thing that really comes to mind often are these kind of headlines that we hear about these large scale um, terror attacks. Um, most recently, we've seen some really gruesome uh, violence in Burkina Faso as well as Niger. Um, and there's constant discussions about sort of the, the prospect of um, Islamic State and Al Qaeda kind of expanding their reach um, in Africa. And so often these kinds of insurgents are really framed as Islamic terrorists. 
Um, and at the same time, we also have a, a quite large literature on rebel governance. Um, but we actually have a much scarcer literature on um, jihadist governance in the Sahel. So we have um, quite a lot of research which has looked at um, the Middle East, looking at Islamic State uh, or the Taliban. Um, and in Africa, we have um, a rich kind of scholarship on, on Al-Shabaab um, and Boko Haram, as well as literature on uh, the Malian uh, jihadist groups, particularly in northern Mali. Um, but none of these uh, have systematically looked at governance per se. Um, and and a, a, the kind of main puzzle that really is sort of driving this research is this constant sort of friction um, between some of the assumptions that we see in the literature, as well as um, the observations that we're actually seeing um, in the field. So we know that this existing lens of terrorism is really not sufficient. Um, and we also know that the kind of assumptions that really underpin the rebel governance agenda, which often assumes that these actors always control um, territory or need to set up institutions and provide kind of consistent public services, um, this may not necessarily be applicable to all cases that we're seeing um, in the Sahel. So before kind of diving into um, the rest of uh, the presentation, I'm just going to quickly uh, go through some of these concepts because they're obviously very contested. Um, so when I talk about jihadist insurgents, uh, what I'm talking about are um, basically militants who broadly affiliate to Salafist jihadism. Um, and when we talk about rebel governance, the main kind of uh, definition that is out there is um, the creation of institutions and practices by rebels um, that intend to, sh to shape the social, political and economic life of civilians during civil war. And we also have um, uh, an, a, def a definition of jihadist governance, um, which is territories that have been declared as emirates, Islamic states or caliphates, and that are controlled and governed by militant jihadi groups. And so that what we'll see and also in the rest of the presentation um, is that some of these cases that we, we look at in the Sahel might not necessarily um, fit with these current definitions and perhaps these actually need to be broadened. So um, I'm going to just take you through some of the kind of main um, jihadist groups that we're, we're interested in in the Sahel. Um, so, so the first one is Group for Support of Islam and Muslims, um, more well known for its French acronym JNIM. Um, this is essentially a coalition of Al Qaeda affiliated jihadi groups, including Ansardin, um, Al Murbutun, Akim, and uh, Katiba Masina, which I'm going to go into a lot more depth into later. Um, and this group is, you know, very much active in the tri border area uh, uh, of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, as well as um, kind of deeply embedded in all of these countries. Um, and then you have Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, um, which is, you know, uh, an Islamic state affiliate group, which has become increasingly active um, in, in the same sorts of areas, the tri border area, um, as well as Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. Um, and then you have Ansar al-Islam, which kind of started out as a, a much more kind of homegrown insurgency in Burkina Faso, um, now also active in the in the tri-border area with Mali and, and Niger, um, but which is sort of kind of fragmented after its um, leader was, was killed and it's now kind of been absorbed much more into Jainim. And then, of course, you have Boko Haram um, in north and in northeastern Nigeria. And I think what's important to keep in mind when I talk about these groups is that while I refer to them with these kind of cohesive names, um, these are very much far from being kind of cohesive entities. Um, they are much more uh, fragmented and they consist of kind of coalitions of factions um, that are uh, constantly going into new alliances um, and which generally have quite a decentralized type of organization. Um, and now, keeping th these groups in mind, I'm going to kind of try and draw some very broad um, strokes in terms of the types of patterns of governance that we actually see these types of groups use. Um, so the first really interesting insight to come out of this research is that often these types of groups actually use pre-existing social and religious networks to really prepare the ground um, long before governance becomes visible. So a really good example of this um, is Arkim and the GSPC um, kind of implantation of Northern Mali, which uh, Morten Boas has looked at uh, in his research uh, and really shows how they spend a lot of time um, 
developing uh, social networks, uh, alliances with uh, business elites and important local religious leaders to kind of become very socially embedded long before um, they started trying to implement a governance project in the north. Um, another really interesting insight is that social control appears to matter in all of these cases. Um, while territorial control often really fluctuates. So what's kind of distinctive about jihadi groups is that um, they often come under a lot of military pressure, which means that it can often be difficult to actually hold on to ter territorial control. But what we see is that despite this, the control of a people seems to, to really matter more. And so we need to better understand the kind of mechanisms that they're using to achieve this. Um, and so institutions um, may be a kind of a bedrock of their governance system. So we've seen um, the development of sort of Islamic institutions in some cases, as we'll see in northern Mali. But this need not always be very visible or formalized. These can also be very much more ad hoc um, and, and, and sort of informal. Another interesting kind of uh, point is, is the aspect of service provision, which has been sort of um, an element which the rebel governance literature has looked at a lot, particularly with regard to sort of how um, consistent these services are, how um, equally they are in terms of their distribution. Um, but what we're seeing with these groups is it tends to be um, somewhat more limited. Um, they often tend to claim that they can offer some sort of protection or perhaps more equal e access to resources, but we still don't have a really solid understanding of what these actually, uh, what this actually translates to in practice, um, even though rhetorically they really aim to offer kind of an alternative governance to the status quo. Um, another really uh, important aspect in the Sahel is that these groups are, are often positioning the, their governance project within local conflicts and especially within inter and intergroup cleavages. So these groups are not just arriving onto you know, a blank slate. Um, they are often have a kind of sophisticated reading of the social uh, terrain in which they operate and they use this uh, to their advantage uh, when building up their governance projects. What we're also seeing is that some form of Sharia law um, is implemented across these groups, um, but it's still very, still very little is known about how this is actually sort of practiced on the ground um, and received by, by local populations. Um, and another interesting aspect is, of course, the use of violence. So um, this can really range from being highly selective. So groups like the Katiba Masina, as we'll see later, used sort of a more targeted killings towards non-compliers, whereas groups like ISGS appears to be acting a lot more indiscriminately, as we've seen in the recent year. Um, they've been involved in sort of high intensity massacres um, against civilians and appear to employ sort of a lot more predatory practices towards um, the local community. And another really interesting kind of broad uh, pattern is that this type of governance is rarely imposed. And I think that's often the impression that we get, uh, you know, in, in the media. Um, often uh, these these governance projects wouldn't actually be sustainable if they uh, if the jihadis weren't going into critical alliances with local elites. So now I'm going to go um, more deeply into the case studies, because I think that's where we can really um, kind of go into more depth in terms of um, what some of the differences are in terms of how they govern. So I'm going to look at the case of Northern Mali, which is more of a case of a kind of territorially based governance uh, that we saw um, between 2012 and 2013. And then I'm going to contrast this with the case of Central Mali, where we really see um, that, that they're actually uh, introducing a more kind of remote rule from, from the bush, um, so to speak. So just to give some background um, and context, so this case might be more familiar to, to most of you, but um, you know there was a Tuareg uprising uh, in Mali um, and a coup d'etat, and the jihadists were actually successful in taking control of two thirds of Mali's territory, initially with the MNLA, but eventually they actually managed to oust the Tuareg rebels from the territory and sort of take exclusive control uh, of the north. Um, and this is kind of seen as one of the most successful pro uh, governance projects of um, Akim and the jihadist actors of the north until it was obviously dismantled by the French military intervention in, in January 2013. 
So what we saw here is that this was really an example of um, more territorially based governance, because actually for a period of nine months, the jihadis were able to hold this territory. Um, they developed local institutions, inclu including courts, uh, Islamic police, the Hizbah police, and provided some limited services. Um, cultural life was also tightly restricted. And so there's a very rich um, literature which has emerged to look at um, you know, the cases of, of northern Mali. And so these are very much drawn on um, in this case study for the report. Um, but what I'm trying to actually do in, the, in, in the, the case study is to kind of show how governance actually varied very by subregion. So while we often think that there was a coalition ruling the whole of northern Mali, there was actually very nuanced differences in how, in how they ruled. So um, governance essentially really differed at the sub-regional level. So if we take, for example, the, the rule of Ansar Din of Kidal. So um, Ansar Din uh, actually employed less violence because they had much tighter um, community links. Kidal was um, a majority Tuareg region and their membership is uh, mainly consists of Tuareg. And so they, in general, they encountered less resistance. Um, and they also actually built on the existing legal system um, where local Sharia judges actually had some influence in being able to constrain the implementation of, of corporal punishments. Then you contrast this with uh, the rule of Mujao um, in Gao. Gao was a lot more complicated to rule because it was very much uh, a lot more ethnically uh, diverse. At the same time, Mujao's rule um, was a lot more heterogeneous uh, than that of Ansar Din. Um, and, and you actually had in, in Gao some acceptance for, for Sharia after essentially um, the MNLA had been ruling the area and they had had a very kind of brutal and disorderly rule. So some aspect, some parts of the population uh, welcomed a more kind of um, uh, swift justice system. Um, but Mujao, in contrast to Ansar Din, actually undermined the existing um, ju judicial system and were much more forceful in their introduction of, for example, corporal punishments. At the same time, um, they didn't enforce their rule only through uh, violence and force alone. Um, they were very much dependent on uh, building alliances with local business elites, which really helped them extend control over that area. And then the last kind of um, case of the, the north um, is that of Akim and Ansar Din, um, who had kind of a joint rule of, of Timbuktu. And, and so Akim ruled with a much more hardline faction of Ansar Din, um, but they were also very much deeply rooted in the social networks um, from basically a decade of alliance building, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but in this case, the application of Sharia was a lot more harsh and it did include corporal punishments. At the same time, it was in Timbuktu that we saw really the destruction of, of cultural sites, um, uh, which was essentially a strategy for them to, to legi legitimize uh, their governance project. Um, and, and taking into consideration kind of the, the totality of, of the picture of this rule, it's really important to, to remember that um, you know, in, in each of these regions, Kidal, Gao and Timbuktu, there was actually very strong local resistance. Um, in addition, you started seeing that there were internal fissures between the leaders themselves about how governance was actually going to impl be implemented. Um, so this was kind of making the whole a governance project um, sort of growing. It was making it more fragile towards the end. And finally, um, it was, you know, militarily dismantled by Serval following the jihadist advance uh, to central Mali. OK, so having now looked at the case of the north, I'm going to turn to the central central regions of Mali. Um, and so to just give some background and context about this case, um, you know, as I just mentioned, after the French inter uh, military intervention, um, the jihadists essentially uh, reorganized um, and started to regroup um, and, and organized a new kind of phase of the violent campaign um, clandestinely in rural areas of central Mali. Um, and so the Katiba Masina um, started emerging from about 2015. And today it's really thought to be one of the most uh, powerful jihadist groups operating in the center. It's also part of this uh, Al Qaeda coalition, um, JNM. 
Um, and the Katiba Masina is led by uh, a Fulani Islamic preacher who had a, a large following uh, in the region before taking up arms. Um, and, and the membership of this group is, is mainly, but not exclusively, um, Fulani. So they've actually managed to recruit among different ethnic groups uh, in, in central Mali, which is very ethnically diverse. And another interesting thing here is that mobilization really started a long time before the 2012 crisis uh, through Kufa's kind of um, religious mobilization. And so I think um, what's interesting about this case is to see, um, is to contrast it really with the North. So here what you see is um, uh, that there is this kind of perception today um, you know, that the Katiba Masina and these jihadists are really in control of large areas of rural Mali, uh, rural central Mali. So, for example, uh, one civil society leader um, I spoke with in 2018 uh, described, you know, over there across the river Niger, it's the jihadists who reign. Um, in 2019, uh, we have a Malian anthropologist who describes the zone to be resembling nearly a caliphate. Um, but, but the way that they've achieved this is very much different. So um, the jihadists are essentially uh, combatants which reside um, in the bush, but they're still very much socially embedded in the villages through a very dense network of informers. Um, so they've introduced this very intricate system of, of co-optive surveillance. So through monitoring and sanctioning in the villages where they've essentially elected kind of communal spies, um, they basically seek to enforce compliance and communities who live in these villages um, are forced to sort of comply with the new rules of the game. Um, they've of, of course not achieved this without using force. Um, but interestingly, they, they mainly focused specifically in the beginning of their campaign on the use of selective violence to punish uh, non-compliers. Um, but gradually over time, we've seen that they've also used uh, strategies like embargoes, which punish entire villages if they suspect that someone in the community has ratted them out to the, to the security forces. Um, and what we're seeing in, in, in the villages um, where these groups uh, are, are, are introducing this form of rule is that um, local variant of Sharia is implemented. You have gender segregation and they're collecting the zakat and Islamic tax. They're curtailing uh, cultural festivities and also really strong policing of social and moral behavior. And so what's really fascinating about this case as well is to kind of see how they, they use um, cleavages and alliances for their governance project. So um, what we've seen by the Katiba Masina is they've actually mobilized um, an intra-Fulani cleavage. So in the beginning of their campaign, they started uh, making alliances with subordinate groups in the social hierarchy. So this was particularly with um, non-resident herders of uh, the Delta, who basically had very strong grievances against the Joro, who are these landlorded elites who control access to the pastures. So they managed to gain some support from, from these herders, um, basically by promising to eliminate some of the access fees uh, to the pasture um, and kind of offering this revolt against um, the elites and in this kind of more revolutionary type of social project. Um, but with time, um, what's very interesting with this case as uh, researchers like uh, Eduardo Boldaro and Yira Jal have looked at is that the, the local elites, the Joro, have actually uh, resisted this. So um, they've reached some kind of compromise with the jihadis to essentially reduce the act access fees, um, but still preserving the authority of the customary institution. So what you're seeing is a lot more of a kind of hybrid form of rule. Um, at the same time, other village chiefs and local elites uh, have been killed and fled, and many have had to sort of just acquiesce to the jihadist terms. Um, and you ha also have uh, these local qadis essentially administering justice um, and intervening in dispute resolution. So um, what I'm going to do in the last couple of slides um, is just kind of draw together some of the, the insights from these cases and kind of um, reflect on really what the existing literature is saying about how these groups um, govern differently, which is kind of what the essence of the report um, was looking into. 
So what we see is that um, the, the types of areas that these groups are operating in are very much contested spaces. Um, so you have the state um, with counter terror operations, which seem to be fueling mobilization, but they can also really constrain um, the governance project of these groups. At the same time, you also have um, rival jihadist groups um, and militias or self-defense groups operating in these areas and they can actually influence the, the type of governance um, that the jihadis are actually implementing. So it's really important when looking at jihadist governance to also take this kind of broad view um, where we're looking at a multitude of actors and how they are shaping uh, governance on the ground. Uh, another thing to reflect on uh, or in a kind of an existing explanation of why governance varies is ideology. So we often have this idea that because of these, these groups adhere to kind of a Salafist jihadist doctrine, that the kind of governance they're going to introduce on the ground is going to be the same across the board. Um, and what we've seen is this clearly is not the case. Um, often the, the governance, uh, sorry, the, the, the application of this ideology is very much locally adapted and the application of Sharia is nuanced. So we cannot just assume that this is the same across the board. We have to actually look at the practices and, and how um, these, these uh, ideas are received also by local communities on the ground. Um, another aspect is leadership and organization. So what we saw really in the Northern Mali case um, is that group commanders often actually have a fair amount of autonomy to, to implement their vision of governance. And they, they might actually have divergent aims from the actual central leadership of the group. And so when we're looking at jihadist groups, we have to be very careful in treating them as cohesive and unitary entities. We have to actually look at the kind of the factions that make up these groups and the, the specific leaders um, at very local levels. And finally, um, on, on local politics and conflicts. So as I've uh, said throughout this presentation, you know, jihadist groups don't enter into um, a blank slate. They are very conscious about positioning governance projects within uh, existing cleavages. Um, but this is not just uh, a question of ethnic identity. We're also seeing um, how they are working intra-group cleavages, as we saw in the case uh, of Central Mali. Um, at the same time, we're seeing that alliances with local elites are actually fundamental in terms of enabling these groups to extend and consolidate their rule. And so while in some cases there might be less space for um, jihadists, less space for local actors to play a role, spe specifically in those cases like uh, ISGS, for instance, where um, they might be using more brutal force. In other cases, there might be more room for these actors to actually play a role. So we really need to pay attention to the kind of agency of these local actors. Um, and then finally, uh, local communities and elites um, actually can play uh, a role in sort of shaping governance, and they can do this through various uh, means of resisting, whether these are violent or nonviolent. OK, so I'm going to just uh, offer some concluding thoughts. Um, basically, you know, um, in a broad perspective, what we can see from from all of this uh, existing research so far is that jihadist governance really varies very much uh, at the local level, but we still don't have um, a really systematic understanding of empirical variation of some of these groups. Um, and that's why there's still a lot more to learn about why they govern so differently. Um, and I think this can really be gained through doing kind of more in-depth case studies uh, where fieldwork um, is a core component. Um, and then lastly, um, we're seeing that existing frameworks of the rebel governance literature um, may have more of a limited purchase for understanding jihadist governance in the Sahel. So what we've seen through these cases is that other forms of governing which involve kind of complex mechanisms of social control um, and alliance building with local actors um, is also extremely important, but perhaps less uh, well understood theoretically. So that was the end of my presentation. Thank you all for bearing with me uh, so early in the morning. And I will just finish sharing my slides and back to Martin. 
Thank you, Natasha. Uh, wonderful presentation and uh, what a nice day to start. Uh, what a nice way to start the, the day. Um, I haven't seen uh, that we have received any questions in the Q&A yet, uh, as far as I can see. So, um, uh, yeah, there are uh, some questions that are starting to uh, emerge. So. Maybe we can start with this one, which I think is uh, um, I think is quite uh, interesting, and that is, could you say something about the resource flow that enabled the jihadists to sustain their activities through such a prolonged uh, period of time? Because I mean, after all, I mean, even if this is uh, at least what I called, I would call uh, governance on a shoestring budget. Um, they are involved in a lot of activities, whether, we call, whether they are the purely military activities or their, more, their attempts at governing, even if it's sort of on a, uh, it's a low cost governance. I mean, it still requires some resources. And of course, this has been somewhat of an enigma uh, about the, the financing of the activities of these groups, which has also led to a lot of speculations and uh, quite uh, strange uh, ideas about where they get their money from. Um, personally, I think we have to realize that it's this is a very cheap asymmetrical warfare that they are conducting, but I would uh, love to have your reactions to this, Natasha. So maybe we start there and then we um, see where, it, uh, where the questions takes us and the conversation takes us. So back to you, Natasha. Yeah, um, no, it's a great question, uh, and it's um, it's definitely yeah. something that we're we're seeing in the research. I, I so so for the first thing I'll say is that my my kind of approach has been um, to try and uh, really understand how they're uh, interacting with local communities and how um, sort of to go beyond this uh, organized crime lens. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is that I think there is a lot to learn about, for example, um, how these groups are trying to tax local communities um, and how they're kind of trying to extort the local communities, which seems to be like a core element of their governance campaign. So this isn't something that we've looked at very much in depth into this report. Having said that, we know, of course, that in northern Mali, um, the jihadi groups have over time been deeply, deeply imbricated in uh, trafficking networks. Um, um, they've been, you know, forming alliances with these uh, networks. Um, this has been kind of a key uh, a point of contention. And this is actually why you see a lot of clashes between different factions, including jihadi groups, secular groups, traffickers. It's very much di difficult to actually tell the difference sometimes. But often it is um, the clashes that you're seeing uh, happening in the north are often because of these uh, to fight over control of the trafficking routes. Um, as well as in central Mali. I mean, this is really an area I think there's a, a room for a lot more research. But we know, for instance, that um, uh, groups like Kufa's group are very much um, involved in the cattle trade, for instance. Um, they've also been involved in, um, you know, trade of, of uh, illegal weapons and, and motorbikes and etc. Um, but I think it's really an area of research um, that, that needs to be sort of very much rooted in a political economy analysis of, of the of the local situation rather than focusing just on kind of how uh, you know what the links are but kind of taking a broader lens um, to understand how all of this fits into the local political economy thank you I mean related to this um, but also as a separate issue, I mean, uh, a question that was raised there, which uh, we have discussed uh, quite a bit between us uh, in our own research, but also discussed with um, other colleagues, and that is the role of women within at least some of these organizations, uh, these insurgencies. And here, obviously, there are there are differences, but uh, from perhaps the Katiba Masina again on one side and um, the more uh, Islamic State inspired the groups on the other. 
Um, so maybe you could say something about that, but also perhaps try to put that uh, the issue of the role of women in these insurgencies into this larger picture of and what has what for a long was sort of a latent conflict to the extent that some people started to talk about the Sahelian exception as the place as the one place in the world where the relationships between groups that officially claimed some sort of allegiance to Al Qaeda and groups that claimed, uh, officially claimed, uh, claimed some sort of allegiance to uh, the Islamic State were quite cordial. That has changed and personally I, I never believed in this idea about the Sahelian e exception. But still, I mean, there is, there has been basically a war going on in parts of central Mali and parts of the three border area. And to what extent do you think that ideology actually matters here? Uh, my take on it would be that uh, ideology here as religious interpretation is important, but it's not determined. Uh, but to what extent, particularly when we talk about the role of the women, do we also see some sort of some sort of ideolo ideological separation between what we may call the defensive version of jihadism, which is more sort of towards an Al Qaeda ideology and the offensive jihadism of ISIL, and how does this manifest itself, both with, with regard to the role of women, but also with regard to behavior towards civilian an approach to civilian populations, for example, in between the conflict that has been raging between Jenem, Shlaskatiba, Masina and the Islamic State, Greater Sahara. Yeah, lots of questions to... Uh, yeah, to sorry, there. but you can deal with it. Yes. Okay, so first on the role of women, because this is a, t a subject that I'm particularly uh, fascinated uh, about. Um, but I'm going to... Uh, so, so on the role of women in general, what we're seeing is um, there's, there's really very, very little research uh, on the role that women play in these groups. And I think um, because we're not seeing women um, uh, as combatants in these groups, which you often don't do um, in jihadi groups. Of course, you have seen that uh, very much used um, in Boko Haram. But in, in the these groups, we haven't seen um, women be used as, as combatants, so to say. That does not mean, however, that they don't play a role. So um, in some research that I did on the Katiba Masina in central Mali, together with Yida Dial, um, we actually found that women uh, are often recruited to play a lot more subtle roles. So um, women are very much seen to play a very important role in the local community. And so getting women, um, you know, um, kind of on board uh, and mobilizing them is, is something that the jihadists are actively thinking about. Um, but what we're seeing is that they often recruit women um, to play the role of informants. Um, so women um, can be asked to uh, report on um, movements of the security forces. And in general, um, it is because of the fact that they are, you know, um, such a central role in the family that yeah. by, by um, just being in this role, um, they actually have this kind of oversight, um, which helps for, you know, exchange of information. Um, so, so, and and this is for the Katiba Masina. So we really know very little about the role of women in in other groups um, in the ISGS um, uh, and also more broadly the JNM coalition. But I think what's important, just on a broader kind of note, is that we we have to stop thinking only of the role of kind of what functions do women play in the insurgency. We have to think more broadly about kind of the social processes that women play and how these are being used by the insurgents. Um, and then I think the second point on ideology, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think um, ideology matters, but I think, you know, as your research has definitely shown, Martin, is that um, ideology is often, you know, adapted to the local context when it can serve some role for the organization. Um, so you really saw in this kind of conflict between ISGS um, and JNIM in central Mali was that, um, you know, ISGS came to the ground with a more 
presenting themselves with a more radical ideology, that they were more revolutionary, they were more going to present a more egalitarian agenda. Um, and that was very interesting in terms of how that played out in governance, because then suddenly you had the Katiba Masina trying to, um, you know, losing essentially some of its fighters because it wasn't then able to present uh, an, a revolutionary enough ideological project. So I think ideology definitely matters. Um, and I think we really need to, to to pay attention into kind of the strategic shifts and how these um, influence how the groups are actually using ideology to their advantage on the ground. Thank you, Natasha. Very good answers to uh, compli uh, slightly complicated questions and the reason why they are. I'm trying you know, to, to group some of the, um, the questions uh, together. I know that is also to, uh, as an um, to the audience because there has come quite a lot so instead of reading out every each and every one i'm trying to sort of find a way of meshing them uh, together and so i would uh, encourage the audience to continue to send the questions to, uh, there has been some great ones already but while we are talking about this before we move to slightly some of the other topics here i mean there has been some specific questions coming concerning uh, governance practices related to specific issues uh, one, one that was raised had to do with water. Do they actually try to find a way? I mean, land and water are ba basically the two most essential uh, uh, natural resources here, at least for most ordinary people. And if you then take into consideration that uh, land and water uh, scarce resources already are supposedly in many places to be shared between two different groups, that is farmers and herders, whose functional interest in the in the use of these resources are quite fundamentally different. Do we see any kind of more, if not systematic, attempts at, at governing the water issue, at least some, some indication of a pattern of an approach to this? Or is it completely haphazard? And the same thing, I mean, people here are also asking about education. I mean, is this sort of jihadi governance, the Boko Haram, meaning the Boko Haram Shekau type of uh, basically burning it down? Or is or, or are we seeing a more, a more nuanced approach here across this universe of insurgencies? So maybe that is also a way of addressing this issue of how they govern by looking at this sector wise. So what does your research tell you about this, Natasha? Yeah, no, these are really great questions. Um, I think on the resources, um, I think there's two things to say about that. I mean, the first is um, What's really fascinating when you go into the kind of micro micro level of how these groups are mobilizing um, is that you can see that often, let's say there is a conflict between two sides, um, uh, you know, uh, farmers and herders about a specific issue, for example, a watering point or, um, you know, um, a piece of land that they they're fi fighting over access to. Um, and, and sometimes what you're seeing is that um, uh, one side um, may then, uh, you know, join up with the jihadi groups to be able to access arms um, and then come back under the guise uh, of, you know, being a part of these jihadi groups to kind of settle the score um, in the conflict that they're having uh, with the other party. And so, so what this example illustrates is that um, often at the kind of core of, of what these uh, conflicts are really about are very much local, local disputes um, over resources that we often um, misinterpret to be kind of driven by jihadi violence. Um, instead, what we're seeing is that the jihadi groups are arriving um, and are able to actually offer some kind of um, edge, you know, in, in being able to settle a score in of these local disputes. Um, so this is how we're kind of, this is kind of one general pattern that we can see. Um, I think another general pattern um, that we can see is, um, now I, I don't know specifically about the water resources, I think there's a lot more research to be done there, but specifically about the pastures, I think it's just um, a very illustrative example of how that they're really systematically trying to uh, govern resources. Um, so, you know, with the case of central Mali, um, the pastures are extremely prized resources. 
at the same time, access to them um, is governed by, you know, historic customary institutions, um, which involve kind of intra uh, Fulani uh, clan dynamics. Um, and, you know, one of the things that they're trying to really achieve there in, in terms of how they're trying to mobilize support is to try and create a more egalitarian access to these resources. So at the core, again, what we're seeing is that the reason people are mobilizing towards these groups is often the core of the issue is resources and conflicts uh, over land, water, etc., not necessarily jihadi violence um, or, or, or for religious reasons alone. Um, and in terms of education, I think what we're seeing really across the board um, in Mali is that um, they've taken a very hard line against uh, the French uh, schools and, and Western education. So you've had a devastating humanitarian situation where, you know, um, hundreds uh, of schools across the country have been shut down because of teachers being threatened because of generalized insecurity, which means that these schools have to be shut down. And so what they're trying to do in the areas that they control is to actually set up, um, like eventually set up Quranic schools or to have a more uh, space actually for uh, Islamic education. So, so those are some of the broad trends I think that we're seeing uh, on these issues. Oh, you're muted, Martin. <laughs> Sorry, who, who, who muted me? I didn't think, I don't think I did it myself, or maybe I did, sorry. Anyway, I mean, as a follow-up to this, it was a question that I think we can take uh, also uh, uh, as a, as a, as a follow-up to what you just talked about. And that question, I mean, you mentioned that, um, I mean, some, uh, some, local traditional leaders are able to put up some sort of uh, sometimes mute some uh, some sort of resistance so that they could, that it was almost like some sort of a negotiation between local power structures and and the insurgents other times i mean uh, there is uh, more violence uh, at play uh, where some are killed others uh, have to flee some are forced more or less to give in um, this may, of course, also matter, uh, and here I'm trying to draw in another question uh, on where are they coming from? I mean, are these, are, uh, are the insurgent fighters, are they locally recruited or are they uh, from somewhere else so that they uh, use these deliberate strategies of um, violence, um, integrating to, uh, to taking side in uh, local conflicts as a matter of local integration, or are they already locally uh, integrated because they belong to these communities, of course, they, that may matter. But the question here is, this way of either tearing at the traditional authority, uh, local authorities or co-opting them, forcing them to take the side of the insurgent, what effects do this have on issues concerning gender-based violence, uh, girls' access to school and, uh, and so on? I mean, uh, is this part of a deliberate program or is it more something that just happens because it can happen, I think is the question. So if you can spend some time on that, and, and then there is another, just going to prepare you for this, there will be another interesting question about uh, Burkina Faso and gold mining. I'll get to that in a moment, but first take this one. And of course, we're not going to leave this seminar without you having your, uh, without you having to take a little um, detour into the role of uh, France and Barkhane and uh, the France, uh, French messaging that uh, our calm may come to a close, but we will end with that uh, question. So first, uh, this one. On yeah. the relationship and consequences for uh, gender-based violence and the recruitment pattern. Yeah, so um, I think I'll, I'll take the one on the recruitment pattern first. Um, so I think it's, it's a very much uh, a mixed picture, but from the research that I have personally done, um, specifically in, in central Mali, what we're seeing is um, that the, the recruits are very much 
from from the community, from the local area. Um, and I think there is this perception um, that these jihadi groups uh, are coming from outside. And this is very much very prominent in Mali as well, um, is that there is always this reference to um, that the jihadis are com coming from outside. And this is not a problem that is homegrown to Mali, right? Um, but what we really um, saw you know, in, in central Mali is that um, the core membership base of these groups and the core kind of recruits are coming from within these societies. Um, they're coming from, you know, uh, Fulani, among others, who have been extremely marginalized by state policies which have not prioritized pastoralism and have prioritized agriculture because um, there have been uh, abuses by uh, state uh, security actors, by forest agents who have been harassing these herds. Um, uh, for, for extortion. Um, so there is there is this kind of long history of, of marginalization, which these groups are taking advantage of. You saw the same with Ansar al-Islam uh, in Burkina Faso. They were really playing on this um, idea of of uh, recruiting among those who are most marginalized within the social hierarchy. Again, you see um, with ISGS the same thing. And I think the important thing to remember is that the societies that these groups are operating in are extremely socially stratified. And they're also operating in a context where the state governance system um, is extremely, uh, you know, problematic and fragile. The, 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 the state has been very much um, absent in some of these areas, but also they have employed predatory practices towards these groups. So I think it's important to, to, to have that in the background, um, that the reason why these groups are sort of um, have to be seen as, as you know, um, very much endogenous to the societies that they're coming in has to do with the political and social grievances that really are the foundation for why these groups are mobilizing. So while, of course, you might be seeing um, uh, you know, some foreign fighters coming from other areas of the region and certainly in the tri-border area you have, uh, you know, groups from Niger, Burkina crossing over um, the borders uh, into Mali and out. Um, so you do have that element as well, but I think it's, you know, the, the main picture we're seeing is that um, these are recruiting very much locally. Um, in terms of like the the local power structures and, and um, whether they have any say in terms of um, the gender-based violence. Um, I, I wouldn't say I have a very good answer to that, primarily because I don't think we know enough about the responses of the local elites. It's very much an, an up and coming area of, of research. Um, but what I can say is that we know that um, the policy uh, towards gender has been very much, um, uh, it's very identifiable across groups. Um, so you have seen, for example, um, core to their governance project is gender segregation. Um, it is that women have to be veiled when they go outside. Women are not allowed to work anymore. Um, at the markets, uh, women have to be in uh, women only segregated areas of the markets. So in one sense, um, the, the women have been really most affected in terms of not only their their livelihoods, but also um, in terms of their whole social identity, um, because engaging in these livelihood activities um, uh, are very much you know, central uh, to, to their position in society. And the fact that all of these elements are being undermined um, has had severe, severe consequences um, for gender relations in these societies. But I do think that um, trying to understand how local leaders can, can, can play a role in that respect is it's an interesting area for, to look into further. Thanks, Natasha, and of course, uh, and we have uh, something that is very uh, interesting, but also uh, as an illustration here is, of course, the, the what happened um, in the lead up to the um, ruling uh, in the um, Katiba Masina Shura Council on some of these on some of these access issues that uh, really shows um, that there has been a turning point, at least in uh, with regard to that insurgency with its relationship to local elites, because I mean, uh, the ruling in the in the Shura Council, with, uh, which was about access to um, in, uh, in the Delta resources of land and water, 
basically was a blatant negation of the UMA principle and uh, as they ruled on the basis of uh, autochthony. Um, but that's another conversation that we can, um, because these conversations will continue. But there was an interesting question here coming up about uh, Burkina Faso and um, the issue of gold mining and whether it is um, uh, the person who coined this uh, issue uh, related to information from friends in Burkina who said that basically uh, many of these so-called insurgents are just thugs uh, and this is about uh, access to gold mining sites and that some of them may even be working from gold mining companies. Um, you may or may not want to answer that directly or um, as I would no challenge you to do to put it into a slightly larger or a much larger picture because there are emerging evidence particularly from Burkina Faso but also to some extent from parts of Mali that if you sort of look at a map over recent attacks particularly in Burkina but also to a certain extent in central Mali there is seems to be an increasing trend that attacks by these insurgents to a larger extent than before seems to happen not necessarily at mining sites but in areas close to mining sites villages close to mining sites and so on and of course this begs the question which is if gold mining becomes and gold mining is rapidly increasing particularly artisanal gold mining is rapidly increasing in the Sahel as an important livelihood mm. do you think that since they are their ideology is what it is are they to some extent vaccinated against the kind of corruption that we have seen happen to other more secular insurgencies when they suddenly got access to this type of mineral mm. resource or, build, or are they more or less doomed to go down the same pattern as for example RUF in Sierra Leone, some of the uh, Congolese insurgencies and so on and so forth that they, they become so implicated mm. in the mining economy that they lose sight of their initial objectives for the rebellion. Mm. So maybe you would like to say something uh, first on this, this Burkina issue and then sort of try to relate it to this much larger question about is, is the issue of natural resources where we will see that these insurgencies represent something different, really mm. different, or will they most likely take the same role as previous more secular minded insurgencies and become at least tainted by this, if not totally corrupted. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I can, I can to speculate <laughs> a little bit about the future. Yeah, I think I can say something general. Um, I, I, I don't know the intricacies of, of uh, the gold mining cases in Burkina. So maybe if you want to comment on that, um, you, I'd also <laughs> invite you to do that. But what I would like to say is that I think we need to be very mindful of um, falling into the trap of uh, looking at this uh, in a kind of greed grievance context or suddenly because we're seeing uh, these jihadi groups getting involved in the mining sector uh, in Burkina uh, as well as Mali that they are somehow um, only greed driven and I think th the reason for that is that I think this approach is is very narrow and it doesn't really tell us very much um, about the kind of the local political economy and I actually think you know this is very much in line with your work Martin because I think uh, you know, th th this kind of idea of um, coping, you know, it's 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 a coping uh, uh, by accessing various types of, of livelihoods, uh, which which falls into a much broader context than um, sort of, you know, these groups just being thugs, uh, uh, hungry for for resources and only motivated by kind of short term incentives. Um, I think uh, it's perhaps uh, a consequence of um, these groups 
uh, or the people who these groups mobilize uh, are often, you know, from marginalized sectors of society. They often have very few prospects in terms of livelihoods. Um, you know, these are countries where, um, you know, levels of education are very low. There is high levels of unemployment. Um, we're still in a subsistence kind of economy and, 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 and there is, you know, a huge problem um, for young people. And so, so I think it's just important to keep this kind of um, broader lens when we're looking at how these groups are kind of accessing new ways of uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, sustaining their organizations through through resources and becoming involved um, in new kind of local economies. Um, and so so I do I think that they're vaccinated against kind of corruption. I think, you know, from what we're seeing already, which I think is really interesting um, in, in central Mali, which is admittedly the case that I know best. Um, but even what we saw with um, the Zakat, for instance, you know, this was initially uh, meant to be introduced as as as, a, as an Islamic tax um, and, and a way to kind of um, show their pious authority in a sense, and that they they wanted to kind of lift this um, as an institution. But really, um, what it amounted to in practice is what you've heard um, in the field is, is actually a this is a matter of extortion. And you're seeing that also in, in Niger and Burkina Faso is that under the pretext of an Islamic tax, what you're seeing is actually um, quite predatory behavior. Um, and, and, you know, whether or not that is um, for kind of short term gains in terms of each of the kind of Katiba battalions who are operating, which are very much autonomous in the way they operate, or whether, um, you know, exacting these uh, taxes and cattle is a way of kind of funding the, the organization writ large. Um, that is an open question. And then we need to do a lot more you know, research about it. Um, so, so I would say uh, that I would be, you know, if I'm really going to be pushed to speculate, uh, I, I would be, I would be skeptical because, because I think that, you know, these actors are operating in, in a local political economy um, where, you know, uh, they have strategic interests at play. Um, and I think uh, thinking about how, um, you know, accessing these types of uh, networks and economies um, actually sustains the organization um, is like what is a more interesting way of thinking about it than than purely just being a greed driven exercise. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, just uh, um, to clarify, when, uh, when uh, we are talking about the Sakat area, I mean, we are not talking about the Sakat as something um, as a as a new phenomenon as itself that was introduced by these organizations and uh, by these insurgencies. I mean, the Sakat is a traditional practice in these communities. So what Natasha is talking about is the specific introduction of a Katiba uh, Masina Sakat or a Jenim Sakat. Um, uh, just to clarify that matter, because I saw there was one uh, it was raised as a as an issue. Um, um, I'm just going to allow myself 10 seconds on the gold mining and basically is that what's if you look at the pattern at least in Burkina there is in my point of view little indication that the that these are at least working for as hired thugs for mining companies because rather this seems to be many of the tax has been against worker convoys to mining sites that are controlled by more companies. Um, some of the violence unleashed seems to be a combination of an attempt to rather clear out areas of government control and mining companies control. And parts of this seems to be around the fact that some of the local communities around mining sites have also either been encouraged by the government, gotten, uh, gotten resources from the Burkina government, or themselves organized local self-defense groups. And uh, some of the immense violence unleashed, as for example, the, the last massacres in Burkina Faso could be seen as punitive 
expeditions by insurgents in order to scare other local communities from establishing these types of uh, self-defense groups. And it sort of ties into a larger historical pattern of the role of self-defense groups in Burkina Faso, which is in fact in the more peripheral area, not a new phenomenon either. So, I mean, uh, here, as in so many other other of these uh, cases in the Sahel, there is a much deeper history to this that we also need to, to understand. But uh, this is um, it's, it's an emerging field and something that we need to pay more attention to, and I'm certain that Natasha's research will also illuminate this uh, question as she continues her um, vigorous research in this uh, field. I, uh, we are coming towards the close of this seminar, but we cannot sort of leave it without. There are two questions here, one that emerged in uh, quite early on, on the role of Barkham and mm. France. And of course, I mean, one. I was asked this question by a Norwegian journalist about, about uh, what will they, um, What's the attitude and the mood among the jihadi leadership when they uh, when they heard uh, Macron's um, statement about a possible end of Barkhane? And I would say that they are probably quite happy with it. And uh, this is what they are working towards a long time. And some of them may think that their strategy is paying off. They have basically made it too expensive for uh, France to stay in the region, at least stay in the region in the role that it has now. But what kind of consequences do you think that this message have had mm. for um, for the morale and attitude and the approach to governance of these groups? And related to that, because of course, um, part of what uh, Macron uh, uttered was also slightly, well, I mean, quite a hard criticism of of the government, so in the Sahel and of government forces. And somebody had asked the question about existing state, state uh, security forces switching loya lo loyalty or not. So maybe we could try to spend the last, let's say, four minutes, three, four minutes on this in this seminar on trying to tackle those two questions in combination. Great. So final word to you, uh, Natasha, before yeah. I thank people and round this up. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, this is uh, a very topical uh, subject, of course, uh, with uh, Barkhan's announced uh, withdrawal um, from Mali. I mean, I think if we look in a, in a broad sense about what Barkhan achieved, um, it's very clear that there was um, an initial kind of strategic achievement in the sense that they dismantled the jihadist governance project in the north, right? And they stemmed the jihadists um, from really advancing on south. Um, and then, you know, what happened was uh, this kind of military, uh, you know, achievement created that conducive space for uh, missions like the UN to come in. And, and now we've seen a lot more international engagement in the region. Um, and and having said that, though, um, you know, one of the one of the things that we saw um, over the past, you know, eight years is that the actors involved were very much focused on stabilizing the north. And so um, when the jihadists were kind of reorganizing um, clandestinely in, in rural areas of central Mali, um, this, this wasn't really um, a strategic area of focus for uh, Barkhan and for the rest of the international uh, engagement in the region until it got to the point where it was actually too late in a sense. I mean, these, these insurgents became so incredibly socially embedded. Um, and so the point there is that while you've had Barkhan which is probably you know, one of the most uh, professional kind of armies uh, out there. You've had a UN mission, you've had the joint force of the G5 Sahel be set up, uh, you've had uh, special forces, and now you have the Takuba force, you have an EU training mission, uh, which is uh, meant to strengthen the police and the, the military. With all of these actors in place, what we've seen is that the insurgency has continued to grow and mobilize. Um, and it has today become a lot more active in parts of southern Mali, which were really, really areas which were not affected by this type of violence uh, before the 2012 period. So, so in, in regions like Sikasso, for instance, we're seeing more uh, militant jihadist activity. And so that is to say that despite all of this international engagement um, and, you know, a, a, you know, a very... Uh, 
um, kind of large scale uh, counter terror operation uh, across the Sahel, we've seen that um, in spite of this, the jihadists have still managed to mobilize. Um, I am personally skeptical about whether having, uh, you know, two times the, 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 the amount of troops on the ground um, would have made a difference. But I think um, the, the announced uh, withdrawal of Barkhan is sends a strong signal uh, to to the jihadist insurgencies, and I agree. I, I agree with Morton. I think uh, you know that one of the key kind of uh, requirements of leaders like Iyad Agali and Amadou Nkufa was for France to leave. Uh, only then would they want to engage in any kind of negotiations with the Malian state. Um, so I think um, it, it sends a strong signal um, to these groups that there might be now a window of opportunity to expand. Um, but this is, you know, this is really speculation. You know, we're going to have to see in the next coming months and year um, what the actual impact on the ground is going to be. Um, and so tied in with 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 that, because I think it's the issue of sort of the broader picture of really how are we going to resolve these conflicts, right? Um, and this has been such a kind of thorny subject, um, you know, whether to negotiate with the jihadists or not. Um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, the security forces, um, you know, ha have now come under great criticism. But I think if you look at sort of the the, the different transitional governments that have been here, and even under Ibeka, there has been an expressed, uh, you know, will to try and engage in negotiations based on the, the national dialogue held in Mali, which indicated a, willing, a willingness to do so. So there is some domestic um, kind of will to want to try this option. Um, however, you know, this was kind of a very much a red line for 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 France, um, which did it very clearly has has um, you know re refused uh, such kind of such negotiations to take place. At the same time, you have um, you know key players like religious leader Ramon Dico, uh, who who you know have has very strongly now come out and 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 expressed that you know Mali remains to be a sovereign state, and and whether they choose choose to negotiate or not is it's it's a decision for the leaders of that country. So I think you're seeing a very sort of um, tense, tense relationship now with the Malian authorities and, and, and with France. Um, and it's going to, you know, it's still to be determined sort of um, what, uh, you know, what re resolution to this crisis in terms of dialogue is, is this going to now materialize or not? Um, so as always, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, twists and turns and, and, and interesting uh, political events to follow in the region going forwards. Thank you, Natasha, and thanks to a very, um, although we haven't seen you, I mean, based on the uh, questions and comments we have received, uh, a lively and uh, very attending uh, audience. Um, thank you all, all for attending this. Um, thanks to Cerex and Nupi for uh, organizing this for us. And first of all, uh, and foremost, thanks to Natasha for um, giving us a very vivid and excellent presentation of what I think is very important work and work that I very much look forward to following as we in fact will continue to collaborate also in this Jago project and I think that uh, at the end of this we will produce a beautiful PhD thesis. So thank you Natasha, thanks to Rikke and uh, Oliver from uh, NUPI for doing all the technical support for us. And thanks to everybody that um, was interested in uh, this this morning. And of course, um, as we continue, as uh, Natasha continues her research, we, at, uh, we, uh, we her colleague at NUPI continue our research on this. We will, of course, be back with uh, new publications and new um, presentations. So uh, stay, tu stay tuned and have a great day, even if it's at least a where I am in, on the outskirts of Oslo is looking quite grey and miserable outside, but still have a great day and thank you all for uh, attending. So, bye for now.